Lisa. Oh, hello together. We are starting now with our second session for today. Dana, are you ready? Yes, I am. Perfect. I see that yeah, most of our speakers are there. One is still not in the in the Zoom room here, but we are sure that he will come in a few minutes. So I think Dana, we can start and yes, welcome together. Welcome back to the online forum. So hi, I'm Dana. I'm the technical moderator. And I'm just giving you like a, a quick explanation on rules of conduct and how you can engage. There are just like two rules of conduct. First line, be friendly. Second one, be respectful. And uh, you can interact. For example, you can use the chat room, but please just use it uh, to write comments on the topic or uh, if you face technical problems. And if you have like questions to the panelists, please use the raise hand function. Yeah, so you can ask your questions out loud. So that's from me. And now I'm going to uh, give, now I give the floor to Daniela. Um, hi, everyone. Nice to see you in this uh, room of the Global Forum on Modern Direct Democracy. I'm Daniela Bozinova from Bulgaria. I'm a political scientist and activist in the area of uh, direct democracy, electoral democracy, and I'm happy to be the moderator for this panel, which is an extraordinary panel in view of the extraordinary pandemic situation that hit us this year. Um, <clears throat> we will try to share experiences with the emergency measures taken by our governments, our executives, authorities everywhere. Um, the global character of this crisis uh, is and continues to be unique, uh, at least in our lifetimes. So it's worth uh, exploring it and drawing lessons for the future, how to make our democracies more resilient. Uh, because the health crisis was accompanied by a democratic crisis, economic and democratic. And even before the crisis, democracy was already backsliding um, uh, <clears throat> all over the world. So with me, uh, panelists in this panel are uh, Clara Egger uh, from the University of Groningen, uh, also, um, Tony Scourge from the uh, Nauman Foundation. He is stationed in Prague. Um, also, my colleague from the Board of Democracy International, where I am also a, mem a member, Arjen Nibor. I don't see him right now. Maybe he will. Oh, I, I can see him. Yes. Yes, he is. He, is, he joined the Zoom call. Yeah, great. Uh, hi, Arjen. I am Dobrica Veselinovic from Serbia. Yes, he is. He's not yet in the room, not so we, we wait Hasn't for him yet. to join. We try yeah. to contact him. An outstanding activist from Serbia, uh, and we lost one panelist. Uh, meanwhile, due to the pandemic, I mean, uh, he is not able to join us. <laughs> Nothing tragic, <laughs> and this is Hover um, Mukle uh, Nigor, who is with the uh, Peace Research Institute of Oslo. Uh, he would have been very val valuable with his um, research on the uh, workings of um, uh, autocracies, dictatorships, but maybe next time. Um, so I suggest that we start with one case study. First, a closer look at a certain country. This country will be Hungary because all media uh, on the 1st of April, Hungary made the headlines and uh, it was announced that now it used to be a liberal democracy in the last years, but now Orban has made it um, full on dictatorship uh, by um, uh, strengthening his grip on the executive power and getting the power to rule with decrees. And uh, the one who's got the best insight into the situation there is Tony Scorich. So I'm going to give the floor to Tony from Prague to enlighten us on Hungary. Thank you, Daniela. Hello, everyone. Greetings from Prague. And I would also like to thank Democracy International uh, for this invitation and for this discussion. 
So um, I would like to go back first, uh, maybe in time before the pandemic started and give you an introduction. So after taking power in 2010 elections, Prime Minister Orban and his uh, National Conservative Fidesz party pushed through constitutional legal changes that have allowed them to consolidate control over the country's independent institutions. He won his third straight term in 2018, and that secured him two thirds majority in the parliament. Also Hungary, uh, or to be more specific, Orban has long been at odds with the institutions of the European Union. For example, the European Parliament opened proceedings against Hungary uh, under Article 7 of the EU Treaty in 2018. So the main concerns of the European Parliament were the independence of the judiciary, freedom of expression, corruption, minority rights, and the situation of migrants and refugees. Um, the first sign of weakness that Orban showed was at the last municipal elections in 2019, when local self-governments became actors potentially able to show political alternative to the ruling party in the way, wake of the opposition victories. So um, now we jump to the coronavirus crisis and the law that Daniela already mentioned, it's called like coronavirus law or, or the enabling act. And it was adopted by the Hungarian parliament on the 30th of March and it enabled Prime Minister Orban uh, to rule uh, by decree for an indefinite period of time. The second part of this law was uh, amending the criminal code, which means if you publish false or distorted fact or uh, that alarm or um, upset the public, you could be punished with up to five years in prison. So during this time, during the state of emergency, Hungarian parliament remained operational and uh, adopted a number of laws and decisions, but some of these uh, decisions um, had no relationship whatsoever with the um, containment of COVID-19. Uh, the same goes with uh, decrees uh, introduced by the government, and some of them also had a negative effects on human rights. So let me give you a few examples of those. So on 31st of March, Hungarian government submitted a bill to parliament that would make it impossible for transgender people to change uh, their, uh, legally change their sex. Also on 8th of uh, April, government presented a draft law that classifies document connected to the railway project between Belgrade and uh, Budapest as secret for 10 years. And this project is mainly financed and built by China and is part of their um, new Silk Road initiative. Meanwhile, the access uh, uh, to information for journalists and also data protection have been severely limited. Uh, Pro-government public television has tightly control over uh, information about the disease and questions at government's pre press conference were pre-selected and also censored. Uh, some people were also detained uh, for hours by the police for just publishing uh, Facebook posts uh, that were critical of uh, government's handling of the whole epidemic situation. Under the provisions enacted in response to coronavirus, uh, the government has withdrawn financial resources from local administrations mostly hitting opposition-led municipalities and also placed important uh, private and state companies under partial mil military supervision. Uh, at the end of June, uh, Hungarian parliament voted to end the state of danger. So how does this look like? So uh, two bills, uh, two laws were adopted. So the first one uh, was termination of the state of danger, but th this was just a proposal to government that they can end the state of dangers, danger when they want actually. So it was not actually, it was just uh, appeal from the parliament to the government that they can, they should like uh, end the state of emergency. And the second was also legislative proposal that provides that government may declare a medical emergency. 
okay, so you had state of emer state of emergency and now, now you have state of dangers and, and now you have a uh, medical emergency. And the beginning and end of this medical emergency uh, depends, of course, on government's decision. According to the law, during this medical uh, emergency, the government may, by decree, restrict the exercise of fundamental rights, such as freedom of movement and uh, freedom of assembly. And these restrictions can initially last for six months, but can then be extended indefinitely. And parliamentary uh, approval is uh, not needed in this case. So like the previous law, this enabling act on the permanent danger situation, the new law refers exclusively to the fight to fight uh, to the fight against uh, epidemics, but the question remains uh, now. When we take a look at the last couple of months, uh, will these decision to fight pandemics be proportionate? Will they be necessary and non-discriminatory? Uh, so, based on the examples that we saw in the previous months, uh, we can totally understand the criticism. Uh, international criticism and also within the country coming towards the Hungarian government. Um, maybe more about the uh, lessons that we can learn from this uh, specific examples. Uh, I can uh, talk about it later, but th this was just uh, like case studies and I also presented just a couple of examples. There were also other decisions made by parliament or government that uh, raised eyebrows, not just in Hungary, but in international community as well. So with that, I handing back over to Daniela. Uh, thank you, Tony. Thank you for this overview of uh, the attack on human rights. Also, you mentioned something for uh, sounds like a corrupt deal with the railway um, uh, project that was became classified under the disguise of the pandemic. Um, yeah, all the uh, aspects of a democratic crisis you can find in Hungary, I guess. Uh, but now I, I would like to <clears throat> uh, to read out to you a nice um, um, quote from uh, I, I'll I'll do that later from Francis Fukuyama. The the idea was um, that um, um, equally hit are illiberal democracies and nominal democracies and uh, almost dictatorships by the crisis. Uh, uh, now I will give the floor to Clara Egger, uh, who has started um, a special research on this topic, the uh, impact of the health crisis of the pandemic on, the, um, on democratic rule and human rights. And I guess she is in, Tandem, or maybe she worked before with uh, Raoul Magni Berton, who is also available in our uh, room today. And they will present us a bigger picture of the world, uh, give us more examples from uh, democracies and non democracies, I guess, uh, across the world. Um, so it's interesting to listen to their observations and findings. So Laura, Well, thanks a lot, Daniela, and, and thanks everyone for joining. I will try to share my slides. I have a few slides. It will not be something super boring, I hope. Um, okay, here it is. How can I do that? This is it. Can you see the slides? Yeah? And I can see you, so that's, that's great. Uh, well, yes, thanks a lot, Daniela, for the uh, for the introduction. So I think perhaps the, uh, well, we, we, will, we will be short, but the, uh, the idea of this uh, very uh, short talk will be to sort of give a, a comparative view of uh, Corona dictatorships, focusing on Europe uh, first, um, sort of zooming in uh, into the uh, European situation. Um, so that's a, a project that uh, we have started two weeks ago, and we started it over the summer, but uh, we got funding two weeks ago, and Democracy International is, uh, is on the board of the project, so we are also very happy to have uh, activists and, and, uh, and civil society groups uh, providing their own uh, expertise to the, uh, to the project. It's a project that is co-led uh, or co-organized between the Netherlands, where I currently live and France, where Hal is, 
Uh, well, and myself, I'm a political scientist, and I'm also, um, yeah, I'm an activist of direct democracy specifically in France. Uh, so I've been part of several groups defending the introduction of initiative and referendum uh, in France the past uh, years. Paul, do you want to say a few words about yourself? No? Yes? Well, no? No, no, uh, continue, please. Uh... Okay, good. Um, so just a few words about the project, uh, because we are still looking for uh, partners. Uh, Hazlet is uh, always, in terms of research, that's uh, a collaborative and behavior. So we have a lot of universities around the table so far, but we're still looking for more people to join. So if you want to join, well, feel free to contact me. And basically the idea of the project, the project is called Exceptius for Exceptional uh, Politics. And it aims to daily map what is going on in terms of exceptional measures. So basically decision-making that departs from uh, I would say ordinary democratic rules or human rights protections uh, from January the 1st of uh, 2020 until uh, the future, uh, hopefully. So the idea is to really uh, try to analyze how yeah, democracies are resilient to crisis. So the corona uh, pandemic is one example of crisis, but there could be many other ones such as yeah, terror attack, um, natural disaster or conflicts, we would like them to offer to extend the project to non-European countries. Um, we are covering what is going on at the regional level because there's a lot going on at the regional level. So we have uh, so far 32 countries included in 500 subnational uh, region from the uh, European economic uh, area. And the project has two objectives. So first is mapping out what is going on in terms of, uh, yeah, uh, restriction of liberties, both basic and I would say fundamental liberties, restriction of democratic process, but also implementation, right? Deployment of the police, deployment of the army, uh, suspension of, for example, the right to a free trial and, and these type of measures. Um, and after the mapping phase, we want to assess the political impact of uh, exceptional rule and to unpack the determinants of it. What explains why some countries will take harsher measure, measures than, than others? So, so far we have uh, 15 partners, now 17 since, uh, since this morning. So if you're willing to join, access the data, uh, do a workshop with us, you're more than welcome to, uh, to contact me. So what I would like to do is just to sort of take a broad view of what is going on in a few uh, country of, um, of the EU. First looking at how sort of they score, right? In terms of human rights limitations, and also in terms of, I would say, um, harshness of implementation of, of uh, the measures and basically to do that and that's sort of uh, these slides we have set up two indicators so the first one is a freedom limitation score which sort of uh, identify all the measures that are limiting the freedom of the people freedom of movement freedom of assembly freedom of speech uh, but that could be also you know uh, the an obligation to wear masks, uh, limitation on private gathering, attack on uh, yeah, the rights to, to privacy. And this course, it is, that's a scale combining different measures and it goes from zero, so if you, there are no measures at all, to 10 if the measures are very, like there's a lot of different measures, right? So it's, it's sort of an aggregate. And this, Sarah, can yeah? I just interrupt you? Could it be, would it be possible to come a little bit closer to the microphone? I have some yeah. messages here that yeah. the sound is not so fine. Oh, a little sure. bit closer would be, I think, great. I have a very old computer in the office, so yeah. Uh, can you hear me better? Yeah, it's good like this. I, I think it's better, but it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I will. I will stay very close, so that you can see my face like that, very closely. Um, so I think a first sort of finding we have that is well, perhaps not so surprising is that a lot of countries have actually implemented a lot of restrictions, right? We have no country scoring at zero. The first, I would say the country where the few measures are at five. It means that in Europe, we've seen an increase in the limitation and the restrictions, right? Um, so some countries were more minimal than other, uh, say for example, the countries such as Sweden, um, the UK or Germany score around five. Then we have the group 
of say Nordic, Nordic countries plus uh, the Netherlands and Australia, uh, no, um, Austria, sorry, at six. And then I would say we have countries which implemented a lot of uh, restrictions that are very high on the score, uh, such as uh, Greece, but also Hungary, uh, France, Bulgaria. So what is sort of striking is that you can see groups of country that you perhaps may not expect to see together, right? So France is actually closer to what is currently going on in Hungary, uh, Bulgaria, and Greece than what is going on in Germany. So that's sort of the the, the first uh, the first finding uh, we have. So even if the scale is sort of zero to ten, that's a short scale. There's a lot of difference, right, between a country such as Sweden with five and a country that is at nine, like Greece. It means that there is a lot of uh, measures that are taken on top of um, of what is going on in Sweden. And then the other uh, indicator we are working on is what we call the depth of control. Uh, so basically, the level of enforcement and coercion in the measures, right? Uh, and this covers um, the deployment of the military, the deployment of the police, uh, the, the amount of the fines um, that could be also, you know, implementing mandatory hats to track what people are doing. So this is uh, uh, the implementation of a curfew that is going on in, in, in uh, some, some countries. So here the scale is, is from uh, zero to, to five, and this is perhaps where we see most of the difference, right? Uh, so some countries are taking a lot of measures, but not really implement them or rely on sort of voluntary compliance, while other country, and again, such as Bulgaria, Greece, Romania, Poland, France, and Hungary are using very coercive mechanism to implement them. Uh, one can think of, for example, I will, I will take the, the French uh, case here, uh, well, one can think of the uh, very strong restrictions on uh, the freedom of uh, demonstration and assembly that France has implemented. Also deploying the police and the army uh, to implement control uh, in the streets. So in comparison, and it's not to say that there's nothing going on in this country, but I would say that in comparison, Sweden, the Netherlands, Norway, Finland, Denmark, the UK has a more, say, uh, less, a constraining way of uh, implementing the, um, the measures. So that's sort of a, an initial broad look of what, in, uh, what is going on in, in different countries and what are sort of the group of countries when it comes to, I would say, the uh, intensity of uh, the backslide of democracy. It's important to note that, of course, as Daniela and pointed out, a lot was going on well before, right? Corona, Corona sort of accelerated the pace of uh, the backsliding of democracy, but it was uh, also the case in a lot of countries before. Once we got that, we were trying to understand why, what, what makes uh, some country more resilient to crisis than other. And we tried to investigate a few, a few factors. And here I will, I will leave the floor to, um, to Raoul so that he can explain uh, the type of explanation uh, we looked at. Sorry, thank you, Clara. Uh, yes, our results are now very explore, exploratory. In, uh, so uh, you cannot trust us a lot, but uh, uh, they are interesting because they are the first result about uh, the general logic of this, um, of this difference between countries. We don't want to explain specific cases, but uh, only the general trend and uh, we won't explain the difference between uh, countries. And there are uh, three main explanations. Uh, the first one uh, is, um, is um, about the preference, uh, the three are about the preference of policymakers. And the first is about the idea that there is a trade-off between protecting people from the pandemic and guaranteeing civil liberty and basic rights. So uh, policymakers tend to protect civil liberty, except when the pandemic is very severe. And uh, we are four indicators for that. The first is, uh, you see, the severity of pandemic. And uh, this is in the column inconclusive result, 
because uh, uh, the, um, the number of deaths um, is uh, correlated with the difference between countries, but not uh, other, other things. Uh, let me check. And also uh, the deaths are, are only correlates with uh, uh, freedom limitations, but not on uh, the second indicator control on the right before. So the results are so-so, but for the other one, uh, the first hypothesis of uh, the trade-off is correct because uh, the first uh, aspect is the capacity of health healthcare systems. They are, uh, for example, the expenses in, uh, in healthcare or uh, the number of bed, and they are correlated, highly correlated to be with both uh, indicators. Uh, when people, when countries are, have many, many capacity to uh, many money in, uh, in health, they tend to reduce uh, both the uh, freedom limitation and death of, uh, and, and control. The other indicator very predictive of the difference is the state capacity. So, how much uh, a country is wealth, in fact, because uh, if you are very, so um, GDP per inhabitant, for example, uh, if you are rich, you can uh, uh, find some other alternative way to, to fight the pandemic and not uh, constrain people. And uh, this is also very predictive, uh, much, much more than uh, the healthcare systems. So this also accredited the thesis of uh, the trade-off. And uh, finally, for this first uh, theory, there is the interpersonal and political trust. For example, trust for others or trust in government on also in uh, police. And uh, all, all these indicators are uh, strongly related with both indicator of uh, control and uh, 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 restriction uh, of freedom. Uh, the rationale behind this is uh, that uh, uh, when uh, uh, politicians expect that people cannot comply with uh, um, advices and, uh, and uh, uh, behavior, expected behavior, they tend to constrain them. So this uh, is uh, works very well. Uh, the second big theory is that uh, uh, the government uh, try to um, to control as as possible uh, they can uh, the, the the society, and uh, only the counter powers tend to limit them. So we can expect that when. The, 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 the executive is very strong. Do you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now again. No. Okay. So in this case, we, we can expect that when there are counter powers, uh, the measure are less uh, uh, um, bad for liberties uh, and uh, individual rights. Um, this uh, this approach is not is a bit inconclusive because uh, it depends on uh, what indicator we use. The check and balances, for example. Um, we, when we use uh, the, the number, the percentage of seats for the majority uh, or uh, the lack of political constraints, both uh, tends to reduce the control, is correlate with control, but not with uh, limitation of liberties. Uh, inversely, uh, we use here also state of emergency because uh, in uh, about half of countries, a bit more, uh, a state of emergency has been called. So um, 
In this case, the executive is very free, but uh, the state of emergency is correlated with the limitation of freedom, but not with the depth of control. So uh, they are, uh, the results are ambiguous. And finally, the third uh, big theory is that uh, uh, it depends on the preferences of the uh, politicians in charge. For example, uh, Orban in, in Hungary. And uh, there are two differences in preference. The first is captured by, by political culture, because in some country, there is a past, very authoritarian past in democracy for a long time. And, uh, and this um, uh, difference is very correlated to with the measure. And the second one is uh, the different, the, the preference of politicians differ according to the type of party they represent. So uh, for example, uh, we use uh, uh, the policy manifestos during the election. Donc, uh, we can uh, distinguish be between the party who, def um, who defend a lot of uh, the liberty, the freedom, uh, the individual rights, and other party uh, uh, more, more in favor of uh, order or, uh, or, uh, or, for example, authority with a big leader. And uh, this, there is no difference between this party to predict the variance between, between uh, countries. There is only one uh, aspect uh, which is significant is uh, defending democracy. But the relationship is strange because the party who say to defend democracy, they kill the rights in coronavirus crisis. So the more uh, you, you pledge democracy, the less uh, you give it. So, uh, but this is a, 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 a very tiny correlations. So this is the first, the first uh, panorama of what we find. Uh, and we can now provide some, uh, some uh, conclusion maybe. You want to do it, Clara or? Or I do? Yes, I do. OK. Um, so the first aspect is that uh, the, the level of democracy uh, of a country, especially uh, on division of power and balance, check and balances, is not clearly a, a cause of uh, uh, avoiding uh, uh, problems on, on, uh, on individual rights. However, uh, we find that uh, uh, the country who have more democratic people also trust more the power. And uh, trust is very important to, 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 to predict that. Look, there is a, a, a indirect, indirect causality from being very democratic and avoiding um, uh, to uh, authoritarian measures during the crisis. So the, um, now we expect to, to have uh, more data to analyze the change day by day, because now it's only uh, for the first period of the crisis. And uh, we will be able maybe you give you more information the next year. Can I, can I, you. I just wanted to perhaps rephrase very uh, bluntly uh, what the findings are, uh, is that, well, institutions of democratic system, be they counterpowers, political parties, even if they claim to defend democracies, they are not very helpful in terms of crisis, in times of crisis. So even if you have a very strong democratic system, it will not like lead your country or like your region to have a form of like being able to maintain, right? To be resilient in terms of, of uh, democratic rights and human rights. What is protective is actually the fact that the people 
um, trust what is going on. So this is where really uh, it's not only about you know being able to have a good system, it's also about people power in that sense, right? That they have to have access to the right uh, information. And this is something that we, we see uh, in this current uh, crisis and what is sort of striking in the results is that a lot of limitation on democratic rules have been made to protect democracy. And basically the type of um, rhetoric we, we see, so a lot, for example, in France is the fact that people who are against the Corona uh, measures are also against democracy. You know, there are people who have a problem with, you know, democracies, with experts rule, with science, etc. And this is a special, like this is, this is highly problematic uh, because this is a way of sort of, you know, this, disregarding the arguments of, well, yeah, we have to have a debate on the type of measures we have. And this, this debate is, is key to ensure that actually democracies are resilient uh, to crisis. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Clara and Raul. Uh, as a Bulgarian, I heard two news concerning my country uh, from your uh, uh, diagrams and your panorama. And it's the first one is a good one that it's the first time I see my country along with other Balkan countries falling into the same cohort uh, with France in the same cohort. The second news is bad that it is uh, actually, it is it was the diagram of the freedom limitations or rather the enforcement, the coercive part of the restrictions, yes. Um, so your, um, I guess, um, did I understand it right that your uh, research covers the European economic area, which is a little bit larger than the European Union, yeah. but it's focused on Europe. Okay, um, <clears throat> let's um, go out of the European economic area uh, and uh, <laughs> let's, uh, will you please come over to the Balkans where we saw from your diagrams uh, that the situation was worse. Um, Romania and Greece quoted, by the way, maybe you will answer my question later. Why is Greece the leader of uh, restrictions restrictions to freedom? I didn't see any outstanding anything outstanding so far there. But now let's stay in the Balkans and invite uh, uh, Dobrica Veselinovic from Serbia to tell us about um, about the pandemic in his country, the emergency measures, and eventually the response of his um, uh, his own, his co-thinkers, and his citizens' platform. Dobrica, are you here? Are you available? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Sorry for. Your... Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And it was very uh, interesting and um, insightful to see uh, people uh, very on structural level putting the what uh, Corona crisis did to democracy. And it was last couple of slides were, were very, very, very great. So please, please share with us uh, some of those things. Um, uh, okay, hi all, I'm Dobrica Veselinovic from Belgrade, Serbia, and a part of a um, civic movement which is called Nedavimo Beograd. Uh, translation to that is Do Not Let Belgrade Drown, uh, which is a civic movement mainly involved in urban development and issues um, regarding the city life. But also we are part of an, an initiator of this kind of wider network of similar local in, initiatives and organizations in around 10 cities in Serbia, which is dealing with uh, uh, grassroots movements and democracy on, on its lowest level possible. Um, uh, I, was, I was thinking what to say about the situation in Serbia and then uh, I'm, I'm not sure how this kind of current numbers and, and stuff like that will be uh, interesting for you. And we can talk about all, of course, later, and you can ask questions regarding the current situation, but I will uh, underline a couple of things which I think it's more important. And that is that uh, uh, what is happening in Serbia, of course, I don't want to be, to say that that is, uh, uh, that is universal thing. Uh, uh, so, 
at this point, uh, after the first and second peak of first wave <laughs> of the of the Corona crisis, in which uh, we had very restrictive measures. So here in Serbia, we had a kind of curfew uh, after six in the evening every day, and we were we, in the in the March and April we were also. Uh, prohibited to go on weekends out, which was totally, uh, uh, totally a crazy situation, and uh, also uh, older, older population. Like if you had 65 years plus, you were then prohibited to go all of the time out, and you have only a couple of slots in the in the week when you can go grocery shopping, etc. So that that uh, the first thing that was uh, uh, was uh, important to say. Then that provoke uh, plenty of solidarity actions in the neighborhoods. So people get stuck st start organizing on the lowest level to help their their elderly elderly uh, neighbors to collect their garbage. You can imagine how much practical uh, very practical things are problem at that point. You don't have any support networks for I don't know groceries, or you don't have any anybody to uh, pick your garbage and stuff like that to go to your medicines. It was totally unprepared situation. So that 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 was a good good thing, and so that provokes a plenty of solidarity actions across the across the Serbia. But um, after that first wave of solidarity and then the harsh measures. We entered the second uh, second thing, uh, which was then that the, the government, because our parliamentary and the local elections were scheduled to be in the beginning of the uh, beginning of the March, so they were postponed. And and at one point, they were the government started to started to to thinking how they can organize the elections and why, when elections will will happen. And then they saw that the, the the measures from the government are perceived very good in the general population. So the 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 the, the, the government had very kind of good. Uh, and that that is also as as a uh, as a correctly understood that was a trend you know in other countries of the of the in the world that in the situation of the crisis so the government responds nevertheless if it is good or bad it's perceived as as a, as, a, as a good for the general population so then they started in the april with the with the, with the beginning end of the april and the beginning of the, the march they started with the preparation of the elections so that then the government started to basically juking the stats with the numbers. So we had and, and the, the, there is a mathematical models and people showed that we had, I don't know, 100 cases per day, something like that. And then gradually we had like 10 cases in next two weeks. And then they have the, the, this kind of uh, argument that the, the situation was was OK. And then because of that, they organized the parliamentary and the local elections. Nevertheless, the, the real numbers were much higher and the situation was far from far from OK. Then they organized the elections and of, of course win in the elections. And then they that sparked sparked also um, the citizen protests after the election because of the situation in which then we saw that the government is not sorting out the, the crisis. And because of the the the, the plenty of, of news uh, of, of of exploding cases in different cities and towns in Serbia, which is correlating with the uh, with the uh, with the uh, with the campaign uh, electoral campaign. So with that, then so the different uh, protests and actions on the street, which uh, which yeah was provoked by the this kind of schizophrenia. A relationship of the government to the crisis and and not taking care of the uh, not taking care of the the, the 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 health of the of the people, but just taking care of the of the of the numbers and the pools. So after that, and this that it was the third that was second second thing. First was this kind of uh, eruption of solidarity and, and this positive thing from the crisis, another one, this kind of political uprising and crisis after that the government wanted to to uh, um, to, to uh, win on the elections. And after that, 
uh, what is what is we are fe feeling and, and living now is something much more uh, uh, for me much more uh, dangerous. That is that in the, in the population it, it started this kind of general sentiment of or sentiment of not believing in in any any you know like science in vaccine in the measures in the masks and that's basically this kind of shifting the narratives from the government and and the different response to the crisis from the government which changed the the, the strategy for me uh, for, for by my opinion and in my neighborhood and in my kind of circles and in the general population provoke this that kind of distrust in the institutions and especially distrust in in this in in basically science you know that now you have we also had one or two um, uh, hopefully small protest against wearing the mask in public or a couple of 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 of, uh, of people are protesting, but still that is the sentiment which will continue to to develop in, in next months. I'm sure. So that are kind of three things that I picked up from the from the pandemic. One is of course good. Uh, another one is that the poli political elites will will use the crisis for their uh, strengthening the, the the rule of of law and this and, and and this third one is this kind of bad sentiment that people can be then uh, uh, can be uh, triggered by this populism and this kind of anti science sentiment okay thank you dobrica dobrica Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, you mentioned the Serbian elections. I just want to give you a, a number. Uh, according to International IDEA, which has been monitoring elections in the uh, pandemic times, uh, these were um, postponed in 61 countries. And the total number of elections that have been postponed is 106. And this is uh, data from earlier this year. So it might have been even bigger, uh, the number. Even I was struck by the uh, fact that even in Switzerland, which is considered a benchmark of democracy, uh, absolutely embedded democracy, they uh, shifted their referendum day to the end of the year. And this hadn't happened since 1951 when they had this foot and mouth disease. So, so many years never happened in Switzerland, but it happened even there. So, um, emergency measures taken uh, and impacting democracy also in uh, embedded democracies. And we have here the case of the Netherlands, uh, which will be presented by my colleague, Arjen Nibor. Uh, and Arjen, I guess, will be moving in the direction of our uh, other important question first was what happened and the other, next one comes what the pro-democratic responses of the civil society of the democratic institutions have been to the attack on democracy and what uh, lessons can be drawn for the future so um, um, can we have some means for democratic control uh, in situations such as the pandemic crisis. Arjen, Arjen Nibor, the floor is yours. Yeah, so the Netherlands um, uh, were a bit caught by surprise uh, by the uh, pandemic. There was uh, bad preparation, uh, low supply of medical uh, stuff, uh, low uh, intensive uh, care uh, capacity. Uh, so uh, the response was slow. Uh, there was no action until uh, throughout February. Uh, and then uh, in the mid of March, we uh, uh, suddenly went into uh, lockdown. It was a quite mild lockdown. So uh, schools were closed, universities, bars, restaurants, sports, uh, cultural institutions, etc. Uh, they were closed, but uh, we, uh, uh, and it was advised that we it, do not travel and work at home, but this was left free. This was an, only an advice. So we, we could travel throughout the country if we wanted uh, and, and go to work and so on. And the lockdown increasingly after mid-March uh, 
uh, they were actually based on uh, emergency decrees uh, by the 25 safety regions. Uh, and this was a problem because, uh, first of all, these uh, emergency decrees uh, are not meant at all for long uh, and nationwide emergencies, but only for uh, short local situations like, like soccer games and so on, soccer games where they expect riots. Uh, they are undemocratic because these safety regions are groups of municipalities uh, presided over by the major of the largest municipality. Uh, but the local parliaments and the national parliament have no say over uh, whatever they decide. So it was basically 25 mayors uh, uh, and the health minister together uh, deciding on all these corona measures. Uh, and uh, they were published, uh, they were decided upon and then published uh, immediately through live broadcast uh, press conferences of the Prime Minister, but uh, without any parliamentary say uh, whatsoever. And uh, this was criticized by law professors, uh, many associations of lawyers, uh, local council members, etc. And as a result, uh, the government has now come up with a uh, temporary national emergency law to replace these emergency decrees. Uh, uh, this was an attempt to, uh, to uh, address the criticism, but in reality this was not an imp uh, no improvement, because uh, the law means that the parliament for, uh, for, for, for uh, six months will simply hand over all the power to the national government to uh, decide on uh, any new measures. And the, the parliament is informed one week in advance uh, and they can of course say something about it or adopt some resolution, but this is all non-binding uh, and they do not vote on the emergency measures. Uh, also the local autonomy is, is quite curved uh, in this proposal. So the, the municipalities become more like uh, puppets of the national government. Uh, so this was in, uh, entered in June uh, and uh, was already supposed to be uh, entering into force uh, July, July 1st, uh, extremely quickly. Uh, this has not uh, worked at all. There was much criticism, uh, law professors, uh, demonstrations against, uh, against the law and so on. Uh, and uh, even the Council of State, the official uh, uh, advisory body of the government, they, they uh, criticized it. Uh, and then the proposal was changed a bit. Uh, you know, it was uh, the time period from 12 to six months and so on, and some elements were taken out. But the core has remained. But there's been so much criticism uh, and uh, opposition parties uh, speaking out against it. Uh, and the government has no majority in parliament anymore, so they need them. Uh, and the law uh, has still not been adopted. And it's unclear whether it will happen. But until it happens, we, we uh, are st really stuck with these emergency decrees still. Uh, another thing was uh, the follow the leader culture uh, in parliament and especially in the media. Uh, the parliament has now a bit regained its posture because uh, of upcoming elections. Uh, but, uh, but this is more like talk and, sh and show and non-binding resolutions because uh, the parliament has not practically not voted on anything. Uh, but the follow the, the leader culture in the media has really, has really remained. Uh, so uh, in, in the first month, uh, the, the, the atmosphere is almost religious, you know, like, like uh, uh, during, during these press conferences, journalists really uh, uh, like, like they were addressing uh, high, high officials. Uh, yeah, it, the, the tone of voice was really peculiar, peculiar. And the chief editor of the uh, biggest newspaper, the Volkskrant, one of the biggest newspapers. He literally said that they were keeping out critical voices out of the newspaper because they thought unity was now important and there should not be too much disturbance and so on. And there has been criticism uh, also of, of uh, top, top health professors uh, on the measures and so on, but they have really been 
uh, forced uh, to the to the alternative media. They've hardly get, get, gotten a voice in, in mainstream media. Another issue uh, was uh, the in in transparency of government policy. So uh, there was an outbreak management team installed uh, 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 of, of, of health, uh, health uh, experts and so on. Uh, and the government uh, basically said uh, their advice is holy uh, and we will always follow it. Uh, and this was very strange because uh, uh, at the same time, this, uh, the members of this outbreak management team uh, in the beginning were even secret. So nobody, the first two months, nobody knew who was a member even. Uh, and secondly, they didn't publish any underlying science, underlying documents. They only published their advices. Uh, and uh, they had some external guests, uh, but they were all sworn to secrecy. So the, the, the discussions are really kept internal, uh, no min minutes are published and so on. Uh, and this comes down to an uh, unhealthy mix of politics and science, uh, because uh, uh, the government was, was kind of hiding behind uh, the advice of this outbreak management team. You know, they, they said we will always follow their advice. And this also makes uh, the outbreak management team more political because actually they're designing the policies. This was also criticized by, uh, by top health professors, but uh, has changed a bit. We now know who is a member, but uh, still basically we only get these, uh, the summaries, the, the outcomes, uh, and they are broadcasted uh, through live press conferences all the time. And the parliament can make uh, can adopt non-binding resolutions and make a show uh, and, and, and ask for things, but uh, without much effect. Uh, among the population, uh, on the one hand, uh, support for the government is now at 70%, and support for the biggest ruling party, uh, has, uh, of the, which, is, which is of the prime minister, the liberals, this has increased a lot. Um, but at the same time, there is a polarization among the population. So a smaller group of citizens, uh, they are uh, really strongly against the corona measures. Uh, there are demonstrations all the time. Uh, and uh, on alternative media and in the Facebook groups and so on, they, uh, there's also a tendency towards uh, like uh, con conspiracy theories, uh, suggesting a, a bigger a new world order type of agenda behind the corona measures making uh, links to the introduction of the 5G mobile network, even talks of uh, large-scale child sex abuse by high officials, which was sometime somehow connected to this whole situation. And even fights within families, you know, uh, about uh, such questions and about whether or not to follow uh, uh, measures and so on. Um, and this has been, been noted a lot also in the media. Uh, Pro-democratic responses. Um, the emergency law has been criticized a lot. There have been also uh, uh, many demonstrations against it. Most opposition, opposition parties are critical of it, and it's unsure whether it will be uh, whether it will be adopted. Uh, as more democracy, uh, my the NGO for which I work, we have called on citizens to send protest emails to members of parliament. Uh, to, uh, calling for democratic changes of this law, uh, to leave local autonomy intact, uh, and also for a referendum on the prolonging of this law after six months. Because now it is the health minister actually who can prolong this law uh, with after six months after it will expire. And there's been a flood of emails, uh, so it's been even in the media. Uh, and we think it has helped because the uh, opposition is, has, uh, the opposition is, has become stronger also in Parliament against this law. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have to ask you to come to an end, so we have enough time for questions and answers, please. Sure, yeah. Uh, we've also called for a parliamentary inquiry at the earliest moment. An official parliamentary inquiry where, uh, where they have powers to uh, hear uh, everyone they can. They are obliged to come there and they're under oath. 
uh, this has not much received much attention, but uh, uh, we uh, I have some hopes that it will be held later down the process. And for the rest, I have no easy answers. Uh, uh, it would be great if we could think of some kind of direct democracy mechanism for such uh, emergency situations. Uh, but in the case of Corona, for example, it's hard for me to see how this could work. Uh, so I would welcome any any ideas on this and any examples from other countries. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Arian. Now it's time for the uh, questions and answer answers part of this panel. You are invited to ask questions, make comments. Um, I've seen an interesting comment by Daniel Schilly concerning protest, right to protest in Germany that was um, uh, restored <laughs> after protests were banned, it was restored by the Constitutional Court and also other comments on right to protest by a Romanian participant. So if you'd like to comment or ask questions concerning other aspects of democratic life or human rights. Um, Caroline? Caroline, did you, did you uh, raise your hand? No, sorry, we are multiple people in the office and I was signaling to someone who's sitting across from me. Shall I be looking at the um, uh, pictures to see the show of hands or shall I follow the uh, notes, uh, the chat room? I don't know. Yeah. To see who is willing to ask question or comment. By the way, Daniela, I still I'm not aware. I'm still not aware using Zoom for so long how to raise my hand. This is um, how maybe is our done? our assistants can help us with this. Yeah. Can you give us an how, instruction how to, how to raise hand? Yeah, yeah. You you just open the chat room and like on the left side there's like a hand and and when. So if it's uh, I have it to the right, I have the chat. Yes. And yes, I also, you have to open the participants box. When you open the chat, there's also down there the participants and there you can open, there you have a little hand to raise. Okay. Otherwise I'm, you can write I'm in the chat. It. Okay. Oh, yeah, you're doing I'm it. Yeah, now, now he's, he's raising the hand. Okay. So Daniel, you have a question. No, no, I, I was in general, I was a little bit thinking about some, somehow the background of our question. So um, for me, um, especially the, the case of Hungary was very frightening when, when um, a gov government really um, tried to use uh, some of the shadow of the crisis to, to for example, to rule out something um, very different from, from the topic of the of the pandemic and 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 this is the a very interesting question of course when um, when something like this happens but in general I would say where we have um, a, a government um, I think everybody if if she or he is in government likes somehow government governmental action and of course, in, 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 in the face of crisis, if, if people want to have protection, this UCAS government and decree government is, is somehow a natural thing occurring. And as I wrote in, in the chat, I think then, of course, the balances of power have to, to be, uh, have to be um, um, sub in the case of Germany, our, our constitutional court rightly said, well, you have gone a little too far. On the other hand, we have this um, ambitious situation within the po uh, population that some there's a, somehow a fraction which says, "I want security. We want security. Security, security overall." And then there are the freedom fighters, I would call them, and and also the conspiracists, of course, because of. Uh, always in, in, in terms of danger and if something is frightening is happening, of course, people tend somehow uh, to, to think about 
uh, other powers and so on. This is also a ph phenomena we, we have in, in Germany. And well, anyhow, a pandemic is a mess and a crisis is a mess by, by definition. And I think, um, as I as said, we, we, we really have to think about the cultural background we have to develop in peace times in quotation mark peace time, so in, in non-crisis times, to have then, if the case occurs of a real crisis, then, then we are somehow resistant. That's somehow my idea, and maybe I, I would like the speakers to, to respond and also the scientists to, to what they think about, in general, about the, the whole uh, scenery of such a question. Clara and Raul, would you like to yeah. take the question from an academic point of view, from yeah. a scientific yeah. perspective? Uh, sure. Well, I, I can uh, I can give my take on this and on your question about Greece also that I that is still uh, in my uh, in my head, uh, Daniela. So perhaps about Greece because you asked why. Uh, yes. So yes. Hard. Well, bas basically for several reasons. Um, First, Greece is uh, one of the few countries which implemented a curfew on a few islands. And that's, that's a strong decision. And second, the, the management, also it's, it's a point of entry in the EU and the way uh, the restrictions they, the, the, the government imposed on uh, migrants arriving yes. in, in, uh, in Greece was, was extremely strong. So this is, sort of, you know, it's really point of entry. So it had to, the, the type of measures were also uh, linked to that and were in this sense, much higher on, on a range and more, much diverse, but it's true that we did not cover them so much. And, and this is also what is interesting is that, well, we do speak a lot about Hungary. We speak less about France. We don't speak about Greece, but well, this country have sort of similar or close, uh, close reactions, right. I would say. I think on the uh, on the culture part and check and balances part, um, it's very interesting. I think the uh, the German example uh, it resonates a lot also with the situation in France because actually the constitutional court in France made a decision that is very like in in goes in the fully other direction than than the protection of of democracy and and, and freedom. So basically, the constitutional court. Uh, decided that it's possible for the executive um, to make uh, so to to um, because so in terms of in time of crisis the executive can uh, make ordinary law right without uh, a debate in in the parliament and the, the the article was a bit unclear about what happened to this you know decisions once uh, the crisis is over and a question was raised to the constitutional court in in France. Uh, because basically the, the president uh, Macron granted contracts to exploit the uh, electricity network system to a private company during the crisis, taking it as this is part of the package of Corona measures. And of course, this is a measure that is very hard to sort of change, right? Because once the contract is granted, you will not say, oh, sorry, when I mean, the contract is, was granted for one month. Uh, so the question was asked and the constitutional court decided that actually there's no need to be a, a law proposal for the measure to become ordinary law so the executive decision to become an ordinary ordinary law after the crisis you just need to have a law proposal so if one mp is making a proposal in the parliament that's enough for the executive decree to become uh, uh, of, of legislative value so we already know right now that with this type of decision, France will be lower on the democratic scale after the crisis than before. And that's, that's, that's really frightening. And I think it echoes a bit the, the political culture argument, which is our institution are embedded into a political culture, right? So the, the, the way people behave in this institution, so they also make sort of assumptions, right? About how people will react to a crisis. Um, and sometimes they, they don't trust that people will behave wisely during a crisis. And this is what we see in, in France. This is what we see. We are, the decision are tougher because, because the elite does not trust the people at all. They think that they are not able to make you know, right decisions. 
but we have, I think, one way of, we need to be careful with the, um, with the uh, culture argument, because democracy is creating the democratic culture. So we should not come to a situation where we add, we wait for a democratic culture, right? We wait for education to take place before granting full democracy. But this is the type of debate, right? We see right now saying, ah, oh, perhaps we should, you know, be careful and not go too far into, you know, direct democracy because people are not ready. So we first execute them, but this does not work, right? Because democracy in itself is yeah. actually creating the culture. So I think this okay. is- yeah. yeah, how come elites are always ready and ordinary people are never ready? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's that's for me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Clara. Um, do we have more questions or comments? Tony is raising his hand, Danila. Tony, yes, please. Yes, I would just like to comment on the statement by Mr. Shilly. Uh, since you mentioned already this balance of power. So maybe I could say on this example of uh, Hungary that you can see that um, although the power has shifted more towards executive during these times because governments are trying to cope with the COVID crisis, it is important that pol politicians strive uh, that and they um, keep parliaments going during this time. So th this is very important. And also when it comes to special legal orders, uh, they cannot last forever or have an unlimited uh, period of time and they have to have a clear end date and then they can be extender, extended afterwards if the situation changes, of course. And also the constitutional uh, control over this decision whether to uh, extend the state of danger or not must be guaranteed. You also mentioned in your comment, I read it um, in the chat uh, about this um, very common binary choice between freedoms and also security or freedoms or health. So I wouldn't put it that way. So I think we are using the wrong narrative there uh, where you put uh, this like dichotomy between do, uh, these two terms. So you can have either freedom or security. I think it is important to say that uh, those people, uh, those like, um, things go together. So if you have free media, free press, and uh, people who can express their opinions on government's decision, you will also have maybe be better informed from the side of go government and uh, governments will be able to make better decisions. So, um, but on the other hand, it is important that governments show this readiness to give platforms to people and um, show them that they are interested in those freedoms. So for example, if you cannot meet in person, so physically, let's say the freedom of assembly is restricted, you need to open platforms for people where uh, they can raise their voice or uh, you need keep this dialogue going. Same thing as here. I mean, I can imagine that this conference uh, could be held like physically, we could be all together in the, uh, same room, but uh, considering the situation, we find a platform to discuss, communicate, and find better solutions. So the same thing goes with government, where you need to show that you're interested in these freedoms uh, of assembly and ex uh, expression, of course. So basically, yeah, that's just a short comment on that. Uh, okay, thank you, Tony. Um, I will use this occasion to remind you of the uh, uh, this uh, great thought by Abraham Lincoln that those who are ready to sacrifice freedom for, for security ultimately will lose both on the dichotomy of uh, security and freedom. Do we have any more raised hands, uh, questions, comments? Uh, um, you know, there's, there's one question like in the chat and one raised hand. Um, okay, let's, uh, I, I don't see it. So I, I, can, I can read out loud the question. Okay, good. Uh, it's from uh, Lou Bottos, uh, question. Is direct democracy <laughs> periodic um, refer referendums or the daily business of parliament who are repre representatives? Um, Lou, do you mean that uh, what is direct democracy? Periodic referendums or uh, daily business 
done by the representatives. Is, is this what you mean? Yes? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I can take this question um, as a researcher in direct democracy. Strictly speaking, direct democracy is uh, when the um, um, sovereign, <laughs> the people are making directly the decision, the political decision, which is binding. Um, so the everyday business of representatives cannot be considered a direct democracy. It's representative democracy. We are doing our business in our offices at work and they are doing their business. We, we have delegated them the power of, uh, to govern the country. So uh, it's the representative method of our democracies. Okay, thank you for your answer, but I disagree. Thank you. Okay, give us your opinion. We still have some time in this panel. Okay, um, my opinion would be that all democracy, whether or not it's representative or not, should be direct democracy. And at the basis of any democracy, the people are in control. And that can be reflected through the parliament also. If we elect direct democracy representatives, we can effectively have direct democracy in parliament. That's my point. Okay, I, I, my answer was from the theory of uh, democracy point of view. Okay, um, fair, fair enough. I'm thinking more yes. about the future. We have to elect direct democracy representatives. Oh, yeah. And if we do that, we'll effectively have direct democracy on a daily basis on every Absolutely. issue. Absolutely, yeah. And the people can participate um, on every issue. That's my vision of real direct democracy. That's the one I want to experience not yeah. periodic referendums once or twice a year. Um, yes. I wonder if this group is um, in agreement with that or if they're okay. satisfied with only periodic referendums. It doesn't seem like a satisfactory. Yeah, I will invite the others to comment only. I, I can tell you that in my country, I don't even have periodic referendums that I will be happy to have periodic ones, yes. Anyone else on the issue of direct democracy and how direct rule is um, uh, implemented through the um, through the political representation in parliament? For me, this is key to effectively have direct democracy in our society. We need direct democracy representatives who have a platform where they will exclusively represent the majority will of their electorate or their constituents for me that's the ultimate form of direct democracy yeah but will you be happy dealing with the everyday matters of every institution and not doing your own uh, business um, yeah because I, I think i'll answer that i think uh generally there's typically about a year before processes get finalized and there's a lot of time to uh, consider every proposal things don't are not they, they don't require immediate attention so people have a lot of time to deliberate and figure out their position it's it'll be a lot of work for for the electorate a lot more than it is now but that's the cost of democracy is it not being involved are we yeah doing? absolutely <laughs> That's okay, we here. will get the comment from Daniel Schiele as well. But before that, I will read out uh, uh, Olaf's um, input here. Uh, he suggests that we use the liquid democracy model to delegate our powers to people who are knowledgeable and trustworthy. Daniel, would you like to comment? Daniela, also Milta has raised her hand. I think before me, me. Okay, I, yeah. Please go ahead, Mute. I do have a very different question. So if the, Daniel first wants to say something about the discussion that was just passed, that's, that's also fine. Okay, okay. but I, I just wanted to respond to, to, to the, I think, unrealistic dream to have somehow uh, pure citizens in parliament. So I think it's it's a, a simple um, 
uh, by nature, um, people change if they take responsible in, in, in government or become a parliamentarian. And, uh, you know, it's a little bit like the fairy tales when the shield in Shilda, there's a, when people try to bring the sun in the church and, and open pots and pans and, and then uh, run in the church and try to bring the light in the church, but it never, this, if they opened the pots, the light was already gone. And I think we, you need really the balance in a society, in a democracy of direct democracy and decision making by the people which are not politicians. And of course, uh, the very honorable politicians making laws and uh, in, in, re in representation of the people. So that's what was just my comment to, to, to our friend who just spoke. Daniel, can you put that in the chat, the fairy tale? I didn't quite get the, uh, how you spell it, what that reference is. And it's, it sounds... Tell us the fairy tale in Tukul. In two sentences. So. Ah, okay, the, 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 this is a, the Schildburger there, very famous uh, little village, Schilda in Germany. And there are very funny stories of what, what they have tried and they are metaphorical for such things. So they once they had a very uh, uh, a church without windows. And they said, well, how can we bring the sun in, the, in, the, in this building? And they said, well, one guy said, well, let's bring all our pots uh, you have for cooking pots. And, and then we open the pots and then we let the sun shine in. And then we very fast close the, the, it and then we bring it in the church and then they open it. And of course, uh, the sun was gone. And this is, a, uh, we are using this um, for, for a task yeah. like bringing non-politicians in the parliament. This is really what is amazing me that people for centuries try to bring non-politicians to become politicians. Also Donald Trump. But Daniel, said, Daniel, Daniel. sorry to interrupt you. We are here. I, I, the like the, I like the fairy tale and I also like the discussion, but we are here for the Corona and the Corona dictatorship panel. We have a wonderful, wonderful track. It's called "The Future of Direct Democracy and Democracy," okay. which we also will have another panel today. And I think this is something we can discuss there or in between the sessions. We have only nine minutes left, then we have a thirty-minute break. So I would really try to stay now on the topic. I think Myrta has a question to that, and you can. We are happy to leave the chat room okay. open for further discussion after the official ending of this session. Yeah. Thank you, Andreas, for keeping us focused on the coronavirus dictatorships. Yes, Hi, um, so I had a question Hi. to Clara Egger and uh, Raoul about their research. I find it very interesting research to start with, really nice that it allows for like this comparative approach between different countries in Europe. But I was actually wondering, um, in the end, Clara Egger also said something about uh, people protesting against corona measures. And I was wondering, like, the, the approach seems to merely, uh, mainly um, talk about um, what the governments do. And I was wondering, do they also try to connect this to, like, popular satisfaction or dissatisfa dissatisfaction with the measures? And if they don't, what, how do they think you can connect this? And maybe also as a question to the other panel men members, because, um, for example, uh, Arjen Nijboer also talks about the popular dissatisfaction in the Netherlands, even though in their approach of the research, the Netherlands seems to allow for quite some freedom. Uh, I wonder how could you connect these two things? Well, yeah. Clara, have you measured yeah. the sum happiness index? Or yeah, is it well, at all relevant in the uh, health crisis? I don't know. No, that's uh, well. That's uh, super relevant, and, and and thanks a lot for the uh, comment. And and uh, yeah, please send us comments because it's we need that type of comments. Uh, quickly, uh, what's the first step for us is really to make sense of what is going on in regions. So we are covering as much country as we can, having people really mapping what actually governments are doing, but we map also protests and acts of, of violence. Well, to give you an example, perhaps you follow that, but a, a bus driver in France was killed uh, because he asked for some, like, for, he asked some people to put the mask on. So these are the type of, you know, sort of tension we are trying to grasp. 
And the next step is act is really tackling uh, what you are saying, Amirta. It's it's really about understanding what is the political impact of the situation, also at the regional level. How people, you know, more. Uh, uh, what is the impact on protest? What is the impact on? Um, uh, yeah, well, opinion about democracy, what is the impact? And here we lie with other initiatives that are looking at, you know, trying to understand how people are feeling in this, uh, in this, uh, in this period. So yes, well, really you, well, you have my email, I can put it in the chat. If you want to contribute, we would love to cover more countries, uh, but we, are, we, need, we need more people, we need more hands. And uh, we can we can provide some data already to start if you're willing to to help in that regard. Okay, thank you, Clara. Mirte, do you have yourself a comment on this? Yeah, um, um, thank you for the for the question uh, for the for the answer. Sorry, uh, I was wondering if you would hypothesize, so to say, maybe also to the other panel members, if you think about this difference between um, strict rules and not strict rules or uh, strong coercion and uh, uh, enforcement of the rules and how people react to it, what do you think we will see? Is it more that the stronger the, the, the coercion, the more likely people are to, to protest or actually the other way around? Maybe. I was wondering what people think and, and why. In my opinion, both can make people take to the streets, uh, both uh, very strict coercion and also uh, like in my country, they kept changing the rules every day, which was uh, ultimately absolutely ineffective, uh, though we have not been so, uh, so heavily hit by the pandemic, but people are in the streets again, though coercion in my country was not so good. Um, it depends. A little things can be just the final spark, uh, coercion, final drop uh, that makes people go out in the streets, protest in more violent or non-violent forms of opposition. This is in my opinion. Um, there is another question I came across. Uh, many scientists deal with the question whether Dictatorships or democracies, full-fledged democracies are better suited to respond to crises like the pandemic, uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so would you like to give some input here on this question or so we can wrap up in a couple of minutes? Do, does it seem at all a relevant question? After all, as um, um, uh, Clara and Rose said, maybe the capacity, the governing capacity, political culture, and these other drivers are uh, important, not so much the form uh, of the rule of the regime. <clears throat> and can we draw, I, I ask um, anyone who can make some input here, anything that can we can draw as a lesson from what happened so far? Um, I have heard um, one thing so far that we should not let the measures be um, for indefinite time. Any measure has to have a final date a term for which it is introduced. Maybe other recommendations, uh, guidelines for monitoring democracy in future situations like this. For example, that every measure has to be provided by law uh, to have a legitimate aim, not to be oversized. I, I saw Tony raising a hand. Okay, Tony. Yes, exactly. Thank you. So I would just like to add, just to, as a general conclusion, that I think the measures uh, should definitely be proportionate, non-discriminatory, and necessary above all. 
Um, and I also think that uh, since the voting is the most important channel for citizens' participations, uh, participation, uh, I think um, democracies must invent in new, safe, and also easier way of voting. Uh, so be it by mail or online. Uh, so you need to find alternatives in case this is not possible. And of course, um, just a general remark, you cannot lose critical voices during these times because it is very important that uh, this is how um, dialogue is continued by uh, cri criticizing. When I say criticize, it can be like suggestion or uh, maybe ideas for a better uh, handling of the situation. But this dialogue must continue. If you cannot go on the street, you must create an uh, alternative sure. platform. Yeah. I have to interrupt the draw like a really nice words um, for the end. We have to close this panel. Okay. Thanks a lot to all the panelists. Thanks a lot for the Thank moderation. you. Keep in touch. Clara and Raul need your uh, input for their research project. Also, Caroline Fern uh, from Democracy International is mapping out these um, experiences with the coronavirus, so we can keep in touch with Democracy International too. Thank you for your inputs, questions, comments, and see you again on a better occasion than coronavirus pandemic. See you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have now a 30 minute break. And then we start with our third workshop for today um, on the Climate Citizen Assembly in, Fran in France. So as you can stay in this room, you can discuss in the chat um, and we will start, we will be back in 30 minutes with the next workshop. Is it in English or in French, the next one? It's both, French and English. Okay, good. So we will have a translation. Okay, good, thank you. Hello, everyone.